Welcome to the next uh, video lecture of the Knowledge and Data course. Uh, this one is going to be about knowledge graphs. In the previous lecture, I looked at the notions of data, information, and knowledge. And basically, the outcome of this analysis was that formal knowledge is necessary to efficiently interpret and reuse data. What does it mean? Remember, we, use, we looked at data that really was without any interpretation and with any, without any knowledge about what it, this data was about, pretty useless. It was rainforest data or uh, forest data, but we didn't even know what it was that it was about trees and so forth. And if, even if we knew, we wouldn't understand what the columns stand, stood for and the individual values. So as more knowledge became available about this data, the more useful it became and the more the experts could do with this and they really could turn this into information that became useful as a platform for policy making and so forth in this case the knowledge was very much in the heads of the experts and this is probably what's mostly still the case but as soon as you want to reuse data, if you want to uh, publish data on the web, for example, where you think other people could find your data useful and do something with this. So in the modern times of data science, where data sharing is really becoming one of the core strengths of having a lot of data, for mostly in science, but also in companies, you need to make the knowledge explicit. So it's not good enough to have it tacitly in your head of your expert or in your IT department, but you need, in many cases, to also write down the knowledge or make the knowledge about the data and about the domain that the data is about very explicit. And this is uh, what this entire course is about. And the tool that we use, that we're going to use throughout the course is the so-called knowledge graphs. And I want to introduce the notion of the knowledge graph and why this is an interesting and useful notion. So the core question, why we need this, and I give you some time to look at this nice uh, picture, is that we want to have predictable inference. So someone sees a piece of data and knows exactly what it is. At the moment, if you give someone a database, some of them see an elephant, some of them see a water hose, some of them see a carpet, some of them see a trunk, and so forth. What we have to make sure is that if you see an elephant in data, you know that it's an elephant. So how do you do that? You have to give extra information to every little piece of information that people know exactly, oh yeah, this is not a carpet, this is the ear of an elephant, this is not a water hose, this is not a snake, this is the tail of the elephant, and so forth. The predictable inference in real life when you talk about data is really that you have a piece of data, you send it over to someone else, and this someone else can derive the same conclusions from your data as you did. And this is only possible if you give enough meta-information, enough knowledge with your data so that other people can reuse it. Look, for example, at a database. This is a relatively simple database, as you can see. Uh, in um, this would is a way how this would normally be be stored in a relational database. Uh, some of you will have a course on database, uh, classical database, in in the next semester. But uh, already, this is the general idea. You store information about relations, a, a country, for example, in a table where you have columns and rows, and every column is, uh, stands for a particular attribute of an instance of the class country, and every row is one of those instances with all its properties. So we have the, the instance, the, the, the record, as it's also called Netherlands, and it has the capital Amsterdam, it has there some remark about this, so The Hague is the city uh, that is, is the, the seat of the government, and uh, there is um, information about neighboring. So we have the same column for the Netherlands because we have another neighbor, which is Germany. And the same holds for Belgium, which has a capital Brussels, is a multilingual country, and it has two neighbors. So we have four records in our database, two for Netherlands and two for Belgium. Um, and now these are related to another uh, relation, another table, which is now about cities, where we have another set of rows, Rotterdam, Demon, and Brussels, 
and a number of uh, columns. The column gives the name of the entity, the number of inhabitants, the question whether it's a capital or not, and in which country it's related in. So what you can see is that there are very strong relations between the data that these two tables between the data items in these tables so in the first table you see an object the netherlands that is related to some object the capital uh, amsterdam which is its capital it's related somehow to neighbor belgium and some of this is explicit some of it is usually made explicit in a database by uh, what's called foreign keys and uh, primary keys. So basically in the first table, one would define the first column uh, as defining the, the primary key of the table. So this is basically uh, the unique identifier that the rest of the information is about. So the Netherlands uh, is the one thing that uh, the, all this information is related to. And then the Netherlands has a neighbor Belgium, the Netherlands has a neighbor Germany and so forth. You can use a, a, one of those keys from one table as a foreign key in another one. So if you want more information about the capital of Belgium, Brussels, you can look into the city table where Brussels is the primary key, the most important bit of information. And you can sort of import this information into your information about Belgium. So now you get Belgium has a capital and then you get the inhabitants. So this is the standard way of combining information from different tables in, in a relational database that you follow up the links in the kind of query uh, way. There are some things that are, I think, already interesting to note here, namely that the status of the different entries in this table are, is not always clear and easy to understand. So we have uh, strings, pure strings. So Belgium is a multilingual country. But we also have entities that can occur in, in the, the, the key position. So the, the primary key Belgium also occurs in a different table. And the question is, do we refer here to the same issue, the same object, the same country? Is it the same or is it not? And how do we know if it is supposed to be the same? Uh, the second question is, if you look at Brussels, the inhabitants. I've, to me, this is very weird. It's, I looked it up yesterday on Wikipedia. And the inhabitants of Brussels are really, really small, the capital. But this is because Brussels is, in this definition, only the part which is the seat of government, which is a small part of the big conglomeration of Brussels. So you see already that we are here talking about two different um types of the same thing the different entities and depending on the context you might want to talk about brussels as the small governmental uh, uh seats um, or the conglomeration around and all this information is maybe available in the heads of the people who de developed this database but in many cases it might not be the case and the question is how much of this can we make explicit as I said, in um, relational databases, RDBs, there is um, the possibility of linking entries of the tables using the foreign keys and the primary keys. This is an example from uh, uh, the website of the Neo4G uh, graph database, which is one of the uh, best uh, databases for dealing with graph databases and, and knowledge graphs. And they show that um, if you want to follow, if you want to combine different tables, you really have to follow these links. And um, depending on the number of entries in your table, this might become a, a really big search space. In, in uh, uh, database language, this would be called a join. So you have to join the different tables. And this is one of the most inefficient things you want to do. So the more relations you have and you want to really do in uh, relational databases, the more complex things become. And this is one of the, the main difficulties of relational databases. Uh, in our case, this would obviously be uh, similar to our city relation, our country relation, and our, our capital um, a table. 
and um, uh, you would follow the city of Brussels from the country table to the, the city table to get the information about the inhabitants and so forth. So let's look at a different way of interpreting this data, because I started doing some of it, but in, in, in reality, if you look at this table, then you might see something else. And let, let me try to explain what you can see here. The first thing I think is that you see some entry in your table, and this is an, a, a thing, an object. And this thing is called the Netherlands. So it has a name. This object, the thing Netherlands, has a name thing, which is a string. It's a description of this object Netherlands. What else can we see? We can see that Netherlands is a country because it is an element of this, an, an instance, a record of the country table. So that's in the in relation database. The name of the general table gives you the, 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 the class that the element belongs to in this case. Um, there's also one of the attributes uh, which now is uh, has a specific relation gives a specific relation between the object Amsterdam and the object Netherlands. Again, the object Amsterdam would probably have a name Amsterdam. Uh, there is more relation, namely that um, uh, Belgium is a neighboring country to the Netherlands. And if you see you see already that the attributes in this table, in a way, become uh, the relations between the objects. So in, in that sense, this is still relatively simple. But if you follow this up, you, you, you see that the relation has a capital, also implies a class information, namely that the thing that is in this has capital relation is a capital. And the same would hold for being a neighbor. So in, in a way, there is more information to the attribute names and the, the attributes themselves than what you normally would use or be able to express in a relational database. The next thing one would probably want to model, particularly if you take the second table, is that every capital is a city. Uh, so now you want to reason about the attributes. You want to, make, to get the attributes of this table really to become first-class citizens of your knowledge space. And then we have questions like uh, uh, Belgium. Is Belgium a country? If we only have this first row, and we think, yeah, we know that it is, but given only this first row, we cannot tell you. So we have to look it up in the table to say this. But um, in principle, we would like to model it, even if it wasn't in this specific table, because we know this as background knowledge. So you might have seen the way I interpreted um, this table now really gives a complex graph between objects, between literals or strings, in this case the Netherlands, or numbers like the number of inhabitants. I could have also added them to this uh, list. Um, and the main structure here is these objects that are related by relations. And this is going to be the basis for the data structure of a graph database or of a knowledge graph. So we have objects that are related by labeled properties. So welcome knowledge graphs. And this is really what this first module is about. Uh, in particular, uh, formally representing these knowledge graphs, because the claim was in the beginning that given the knowledge that we want to add to data, we need a knowledge representation formalism that allows us to do these predictable inferences to really recognize an elephant when there is a an, an elephant and to do this in a way that is uh, unambiguously the same for everybody who uses, who gets this data and interprets the data. And our claim is that knowledge graphs are a very useful formalism for this. Surely not the only one, so also a relational database. But in particular, when you work on data sharing, when you want to reuse data, then knowledge graphs are very, very powerful formalisms. Up to now, this is very simple what I did, but there is far more knowledge and semantics that you can express. So we started out with the information that, for example, every capital is a city, and therefore we can derive that Amsterdam is a city. The other thing we can think of is the domain and range restrictions we give to the properties. So if something is related via a has capital relation, then we can derive that it is a capital. 
So basically, Amsterdam, we don't need to specify specifically and implicit, explicitly that Amsterdam is a capital. We can also derive it. And the core thing is that we want everybody to derive this information, namely that Amsterdam is a capital in the same way, unambiguously. So this was one part of the extension of knowledge graphs with more semantics, with more knowledge, with more information. And the second one is that we want to use the platform of the web because this is really where the data is. And this is a graph of the what's called the linked open data cloud. And this is all of these bubbles are data sets that people have published in the past 10, 15 years. Uh, some of it is uh, in the medical domain, linguistics, media, and so forth. And uh, each of those data sets is linked, not only on the, the top level, but also on the level of individual data items to data items in other data sets. So I might have a data set that talks about the, the city Amsterdam, and that might be related to the publications uh, that have been uh, done at the University of Amsterdam or the, 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 the VU Amsterdam, because we know that the VU is located in Amsterdam and Amsterdam is then the same object that someone else describes maybe in the government domain in some knowledge base in the government domain. So one of the goals of our course here is uh, to uh, enable you to link your own data with data that's around on the web and the web is here really the, the source of data, but also the platform on which we want to publish our data and publish our knowledge and reuse our knowledge and data. So the next steps are to uh, investigate what it means to formally represent knowledge graphs, because at the moment, the only thing I gave you are, are uh, circles and lines and uh, letters again. But, um, Computers can't interpret images, not understand in any way what they mean. So the next step in the process that we're going to take now is that looking at formal systems to represent knowledge graphs. And for that, we need to understand what formal systems are. So basically we need a language to write down the knowledge graph unambiguously. So what exactly do we mean when we draw these lines and circles and the words that, that belong to those? We need to define precisely which statements are correctly written down so that we can be sure that a computer can interpret them. And we need to define what these statements are supposed to mean in a very precise way so that if you see the elephant, you know that it's the ear of an elephant and not a carpet. And everybody in the world, wherever they are, they interpret the data in exactly the same way if they agree to the same semantics. And finally, we need to derive all the things we can derive from the graph, all the things we can infer, the predictable inference. So now if you think back, uh, then, then you might have seen this already, namely in a logic. So that's what logical formalisms are for. You write down an interpretation of the world and the logic allows you to draw conclusions in a well understood way. So you know exactly what follows from a logical formula because of the semantics that is given to the logic. And the example that you've seen, some of you at least in uh, logical sets, is the propositional logic and uh, first order logic. We will focus here on the propositional logic because it's very simple. And even if you haven't seen it, I'm sure you will understand, but there will be an extra lecture to remind you or to introduce propositional logic. So what's next? We really need to look into formal systems and we do this by starting with propositional logic because it's very easy to understand and very simple to, uh, to introduce if you haven't seen it before. Then I will give some more examples of formal systems just to give you a feeling that this is not one uh, one horse pony, but but this is one horse show, whatever. Uh, but this is really something um, uh, very well thought through and um, easy to apply once you understand the general idea. Uh, and then finally, uh, we will develop a formal system for simple knowledge graphs in a similar way to propositional logic. 
Next week, in the next module, we'll look at the impact of using the web as infrastructure without losing the sort of formal basis and without losing, losing the notion of knowledge graphs. Uh, and continue on this one under the, uh, the, 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 the web paradigm. And this is going to what we do in the next module. Thank you.